So our final speaker in this uh, panel is Michael Witt uh, from Purdue University. He's an assistant professor of library science uh, and the interdisciplinary uh, research librarian at Purdue University, uh, where he is the, also the library of the Town to the Discovery Park there and the computer science department. Um, he also brings, uh, belongs me, to the library's distributed data curation center. Um, and he's going to be talking about some of his recent projects, um, including, most importantly, um, the Purdue University Research Repository. Hi, good afternoon. It's been fascinating to listen to David and Barbara talk about their data repository services and kind of, in my mind, compare and contrast some of the things that we're doing that are very similar and some things that are different. And so what I'd like to talk about is PUR, P-U-R-R, which is the Purdue University Research Repository. It is our new um, institutional data repository service in a virtual research environment. So what we're trying to do at Purdue is create uh, infrastructure and service, not just for data publishing and archiving, but for um, trying to address the needs all the way around the data and research life cycle. So trying to give our researchers uh, the um, uh, a platform for collaboration, uh, for all of the things you've been hearing about data management planning, to proposal preparation, to working with collaborators, to staging data, developing software, using the software online, uh, staging, uh, going through your analysis, publishing data, and then reuse. So, uh, a little bit of background. Um, going back to 2006, uh, our university libraries identified data curation as a component of this strategic plan. Uh, part of that involved the creation of a virtual research center called the D2C2, or Distributed Data Curation Center, that uh, I'm an affiliate of. Uh, this is essentially created a a place for our librarians who are faculty members at our university to collaborate with other domain researchers, collaborate with other institutions, um, work on issues related to data curation, do research and development in this area. Uh, one of those projects in 2007 was funded by the IMLS, the Data Curation Profiles Project. And you can find out more about this project at datacurationprofiles.org. Uh, essentially, this was going out to researchers in different domains at Purdue University and the University of Illinois and asking them, you know, what, what are your needs for data curation? And also, you know, what, what data will you share with whom and when? The result of that being a, a case study methodology resulting in these data curation profiles. If you visit the website, you can see what those profiles look like. This is very valuable information for us. We were learning not just about data curation at large, but what the needs of our researchers were at our institution. So jumping ahead to 2008, 2009, within the libraries we created uh, an eData task force. Uh, what we did is we had uh, five of our librarians um, basically got together and said, let's, let's, um, let's get our hands dirty. Let's go ahead and stand up a repository as a prototype. Let's uh, identify five or six different faculty members on our campus that we can, we can work with um, who would be willing to let us uh, play with their data. We'll adjust it into the repository. We'll try to describe it and present the data in the repository. And um, we'll see what we learn from that. And we'll share that with our colleagues um, throughout the rest of the libraries. And so we did that exercise. It was, uh, it was really insightful. Uh, we uh, issued a report that we uh, disseminated within the libraries, basically kind of setting out some ideas for data curation in future directions. Around the same time, the National Science Foundation's Office of Cyber Infrastructure put out calls, the DataNet calls. Uh, we submitted proposals both times. Uh, neither were funded, um, which may sound like it was a failure, but it was actually fantastic because, at least at our institution, it got people talking together who didn't talk together, didn't speak very much previously. So we had computer engineers and computer scientists who were interested in talking with librarians and um, other domain researchers about data. At this, around the same time, the libraries began collaborating with the Rosen Center for Advanced uh, Computation on uh, the Hub Zero platform. This came out of um, NCN. Um, essentially, I'll talk about Hub Zero. And what we did was we were working on different um, ideas from digital libraries that um, benefited their projects. So they had different, different problems like persistence of digital objects, um, exposing metadata for harvesting and for citation, uh, creating ontologies for organizing uh, information in the hub, these kinds of things. 
these are just little projects, but they help lay the groundwork for the collaboration between research, computing, and, and libraries. In, uh, 20, in 2010, um, there was a, uh, a faculty data committee that was assembled. Um, when the NSF made it clear that they would be requiring data management plans to be submitted with all proposals, um, we took that very seriously. And so the dean of libraries, the CIO, and the vice president for research pulled together a bunch of faculty, and they met over the course of uh, the summer and the fall of 2010 and produced another report basically focusing on you know, the needs from the faculty member's perspective, from the researcher's perspective. In 2011, uh, we have created a new strategic plan Except this time, instead of um, data curation being a separate issue, it was woven into the fabric of the strategic plan. So we have three pillars, uh, information literacy, scholarly communication, and global challenges. And what you see is you see elements of data as a part of those things, as a function of scholarly communication, as a function of information literacy, and as a function of uh, our scholarship and global impact. Um, we also created a, the Purdue University Research Repository Working Group, which I, I currently chair, to um, try to try to come up with a, an answer for this uh, data management plan requirement. And then about two months ago, our project was funded. And that's where I'd like to focus my talk today. So I want to stress the collaborative nature of this. So um, at my institution, the libraries, the research office, and campus IT, including research computing, were the three main entities who collaborated. Um, so it, from library's perspective, we're looking at data um, as a function of collection management, as a function of information literacy, um, as a function of technical services like metadata and description, organization of information. IT, they're focused more on the technology, storage, engineer, uh, storage engineering, research computing, this kind of thing. And then from the perspective of the research office, they're focused on um, our grants being competitive are maintaining compliance and providing support to researchers to do the best research that they can do. And so these are just the acronyms ITAP, Information Technology at Purdue, the OVPR, libraries, and also our sponsored program services. And what they, what they did was they said, well, go ahead and fund three years hosting of HubZero. So we did not do a um, comprehensive scan of different repository platforms or anything like that. It was basically a pay to complete that we would use Hub Zero because of the local support that we have for it. It was developed at Purdue, and so we have you know really a lot of capacity for doing software development and for supporting the platform. Plus, it it, it, it met so many of the needs that we had. Just to give you an idea of the composition of the working group, um, you really have kind of a, a good mix of, of the three different collaborative um, entities. Um, all the way from associate vice presidents and associate deans to data services specialists from libraries, um, subject specialist librarians. Um, we have the assistant director of our pre-award services from our sponsor programs office, which was absolutely key. Um, she understood the grant administration process, the questions that investigators have when they come to, to prepare the grant proposal, as well as um, folks from ITAP, from IT, from Research Computing, the Hub Zero Project Director, and a hub community liaison, as well as our university archivist and myself. So Hub Zero, if you are online now and you want to go to research.hub.purdue.edu, you can visit PER. Um, it is a, an instance of Hub Zero. Hub Zero is an open source software platform. You can learn more about it at hubzero.org. It's maintained by a nonprofit consortium, the Hub Zero Consortium. There are over 40 hubs that are online now supporting different uh, virtual scientific communities uh, with hundreds of thousands of users. Um, probably the easiest way to get a sense of Hub Zero is to actually visit one of the hubs. You can visit PER, certainly. Um, but another suggestion I'd like to make is to visit nanohub.org. This is the first hub, kind of the granddaddy of the hubs, and it's probably the, the best exemplar and the most mature uh, of the hubs. But so Hub Zero was uh, designed to facilitate these virtual communities and online scientific collaboration, research, and teaching. Um, essentially, uh, you can uh, collaborate, develop, publish, and manage content as hub resources. Uh, you can also develop software tools online um, and publish them, uh, as well as learning objects, data sets, multimedia, all your typical digital libraries types of things, as well as um, different um, social networking um, kinds of uh, features. So things like statuses, blogs, wikis, 
annotations, rankings, these kinds of things. Uh, I won't get into the, the, the technicalities too much, essentially how Zero runs on a LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, it utilizes the Joomla content management framework. Um, here we're talking about how um, you can develop and execute software tools online that's done through virtualization using OpenBZ and the Rapture Toolkit uh, with a Git repository for version control of software and the easy ID for uh, minting data set DOIs, etc. More information at hubzero.org. So we got together and our early conceptual model looks something like this. Um, starting with the service definition at a high level, what is it that we want to do? And then identifying who, who will do what to support that service, how will it be paid for, and what kind of infrastructure is necessary. And then iterating back into the service definition, fleshing it out, if you will. So in practical terms, what we ended up with is a workflow diagram that looks something like this. And so what I'll do is I'll talk you through the workflow perp, and then I'll do a quick uh, demo via screenshots, if that sounds like a good idea, and show you just show you the system. So again, we're trying to, to look at the entire research and data lifecycle. So from our perspective, from an institutional data repository service, we begin with the data management plan that we've created. Um, a Purdue uh, graduate student, faculty member, or employee can visit her, research.hub.purdue.edu, log in, and create a project. When they create a project, they get a default allocation of storage. They get 500 meg for three years, just because Purdue loves them, because we want to support research. And also because, you know, storage is cheap, and this is transient storage, it's project storage. So it's not worth the trouble to go and administer this. So really, this is a very, very relaxed policy for being able to marshal resources. So a Purdue investigator creates a project, and then he or she can invite people to join the project. Those people can be affiliated with Purdue, or they can be from other institutions. They collaborate within the project, Maybe they're actually using the project space to develop their proposal, that's fine. Maybe they don't even have a proposal. That's okay too. This is not just for sponsored research, it's for all research. So you invite people to join the, join the project. Essentially that means that you add their email address. If they don't have a hub account, they'll get an email inviting them to the project and they'll join it, much like you would join a Google group or this kind of thing. Um, if it's a sponsored program, a grant application will be submitted. Um, if it's awarded within the project space, they can register the grant award. If they do that, they get more space. They get uh, 100 gigs for 10 years. Again, still transient, but um, an, an incentive to register a grant. They use the project space to, to do their science, to do their research, stage their data, and then they get to a point where they're ready to go ahead and archive and or publish data, a data set. And so they submit a data set, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't become archived or published immediately. It sits in a queue for a gatekeeper who is a librarian to review the data set. They're not peer reviewing the data set. They're just looking to make sure that it's complete. If they describe it as a spreadsheet, is it actually a spreadsheet? Um, does it have a complete uh, metadata record? And is a submission um, appropriate for uh, PER? I mean, is it a research data set? Um, and the librarian will approve it then. And if the data set was published, it will receive a data site DOI and then become publicly accessible in the system. Um, or it can be also uh, put into a dark archive. And then what you see over on the far right, at the end of the initial commitment, so I was talking about the project space before that was transient. It was either three years or 10 years. Um, for published data sets or archived data sets, um, they will be maintained as curated data for at least 10 years for the supported life of the project. And then what happens? I mean, it's so far off in the future. Um, what we have set up with PER is that at that point, the data sets are remanded to the libraries and to their collection. And so a librarian works with a digital archivist to select or not select the data set for the collection, and then the libraries are the long-term stewards. Below you can see how this loosely maps to the, uh, the OIS reference uh, model. So I'd like to do a quick 
demo via screenshot. I was told not to try to do this live. So. Like said, there be dragons. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to fly through this pretty quickly. Um, this is what Perl looks like. Again, research.hub.purdue.edu. You can play along if you want to. So I'm going to create a project, upload data to it, and then publish a data set. I'll show you what that looks like very quickly. So I can log in. Here I am. I can go ahead and create a new project. I describe that project, give the project a name, give it a URL, give it an abstract. If I have lots of projects, it's hard to keep them straight, so I can put a thumbnail image up there and a different thumbnail image to kind of help me remember which project this is. I can go ahead and invite collaborators to join the project. So in this case, I'm inviting David Gleich from our computer science department. He already has a Hub account. But let's say I wanted to invite David and Barbara to join too. They're good collaborators. Um, they don't have Hub accounts. They'll get an email with a link. They'll click on the link. It will join them to the project. They can use it and have the same functionality that I have. Um, if I have a grant award, if a grant has been awarded um, prior to the creation of the project, I can put in that information here. I can go back and also submit it later so that our sponsor program services can match the grant to the project and increase my storage allocation and my duration of my project. And then all the legalese, right? So are we dealing with any sensitive data? Is it HIPAA, FERPA, export control, uh, patent, uh, IRB, these kinds of things? Um, if I say, yes, I think I might have some of that data, then the project's frozen, okay? Until it can be, until it can be clear. <laughs> we say no, I go ahead and submit to the privacy terms, and my project is created. And this is what a project looks like. Um, Essentially, um, David, Barbara, uh, David Gleich, they can they get the email, they can go into the project, they can, um, they can uh, upload files, they can create to-do lists, notes, there's calendaring functionality, uh, there's a wiki built into it, and then it does like a Facebook style update. So if I upload a file, it'll say, oh, wait, upload a file. You know, uh, David did so, et cetera. You can put little sticky notes up here, um, more functionality is being added here. The idea is to create a collaboration space. Okay, so just like one of those cooking shows, we put the cake in the oven, now we take it back out. Here's the project populated with, um, with files and with information. I'm going to go ahead and stage and submit the data set. So I can see my files there. I've got a PowerPoint. Go ahead and submit data set. we go down to publications. Create a new publication. There are basically two kinds of um, files that we include in a data set. We just kind of arbitrarily decided primary files and supporting files. So you, you can really wander off into the desert for a long time and have an existential conversation about what is a data set. And different people have different answers to that. So what we've decided is that a data set is a group of files, primary and supporting files, and a metadata record. And you can shoehorn a lot into that. So I select my, my primary files. Supporting files. Go ahead and put in some descriptive metadata. So a title, a short abstract, a full abstract. Select my uh, the producers of the data set, the authors, and order them. If there are uh, if it's if there are images in the data set, if there are different kinds of um, different kinds of files, um, Hub Zero will detect some kinds of files and present them in different ways. So I have an image, and so uh, it will pr present a thumbnail image for me. I go ahead and add some descriptive subject tags, social network analysis, algorithms, internet, data mining, etc. And I go ahead and select the license, the license I want to, to use to share the data. So I selected the CC0 license here in this case. And then I can add notes down at the bottom. So in this case, um, this data set has been used in a couple of publications, and so I'm going to put those citations down there at the bottom. Okay, great. So now here's what my, my data set is now staged, and I have three options. I can preview, publish an archive, or dark archive. 
So preview means that I'm publishing my data set, um, but only the members of my group can see it. It's private. It doesn't get a DOI. It just lets the people in my group see the data set as it will appear in PER. The second option is to publish an archive. So what happens here is the, the, the um, submission is, is queued uh, for a librarian to approve and then be published much like an institutional repository workflow. Uh, data set will get a, a data site DOI. And then last but not least is a dark archive option. So if I've committed to archiving my data but I don't want to share it with anyone right now, or I want to embargo it, sit on it for a period of time and later release it, I've got that third option. I still get a data site DOI for it, I can go back to it later. So I'm going to select the preview option. It lets you look at it. You can share it with all the members of your project. This is what it looks like. You can go back and publish it for good then. Looking good. Okay. And now it's pending approval. Now we've issued a DOI. You can see the DOI is down there. If you notice on the right, it suggests a citation. So if you're writing a paper at the same time you're submitting the data set, you want to cite your own data set in your paper. This is important. Um, you've got the uh, capability of doing that. The DOI doesn't resolve to anything yet until the, until the gatekeeper approves the, approves the submission. And then this is what the, uh, this is what the uh, data set looks like live. OK, so that's the demo. And I'm running short on time. but. So I was talking about um, space allocation and uh, pricing. This is available on the PER website. Um, again, talking about the project space and the publication space, both for supported projects and unsupported projects. If that allocation is not enough, you can purchase additional space. That's the pricing is down at the bottom. OK. And also, besides just the, the functionality of the site, we we'll, we'll provide a lot of supporting information. So, there's a knowledge base, essentially an FAQ, so that you can look and see who can create a project, who can publish a data set, what's a DOI, these kinds of questions. There's a boilerplate text for a data management plan. So unlike Johns Hopkins, uh, Purdue, we offer a boilerplate um, for researchers to copy and paste and hopefully modify. That's proven to be very popular. Uh, there is a self-assessment tool for data management planning. So if I'm writing a data management plan for the first time, this is just a list, a list of questions that a researcher can ask himself or herself about. You know, what kind of data am I producing? How will I organize that data? How will I describe it? Et cetera. Uh, tutorials, so things like funder-specific guides on, on data management planning. Uh, we've done a series of uh, workshops on our campus with our research office. The most recent one we videotaped and put up on PER so that um, you know, can, people can revisit it and play it. You can contact us. And so this is a collaboration. Collaboration is kind of messy sometimes. And so with different problems, you contact different groups, right? So if you're experiencing a bug with PER, you would contact ITAP and report it as a bug and open a technical support ticket. If you have an issue with your preparation of your grant, you need to consult some, with someone at pre-award services and SPS. And if you need help with your data management or with PER, uh, the libraries can help you. Also, on most pages on PER, there's a chat widget that interfaces with our reference service. And so if you don't know who you're supposed to ask, you can always just go to the chat widget. And our, one of our reference workers will be able to help you. So to talk about data reference, um, just briefly. Um, I originally thought, well, we can just copy and paste that widget onto PER and problem solve, right? Data reference, big mistake. Um, uh, we, that proposal was not, um, was not viewed favorably uh, because there was an anxiety about what kind of questions are we going to get? Are we prepared to answer those kinds of questions? And so we did a little bit of brainstorming. We used the DCC's data curation lifecycle model and kind of went around the circle and said, what kinds of questions will we expect from researchers at different points? So for example, a researcher says, I'm looking for data for a class assignment, or I'm, I'm writing a proposal for NSF and need help de developing a data management plan. As a librarian, can you help me? My research has produced data that I'd like to submit to an appropriate repository and reference in an article that I'm writing. Mr. or Mrs. Librarian, can you help me? Um, a student, I'm looking for data for a class assignment or for my own research. Can you help me? Those kinds of things. 
brainstorming. And so what we decided was that it was not appropriate to just copy and paste that widget into the pages. We really needed to provide better support um, for our frontline reference workers. Um, what we needed to do was try to identify and appropriately route data reference questions, questions about PER, about data management, and et cetera. And so that's what we did. Uh, we put together training for the front, frontline reference workers on how to route questions that related to PER. And what they did was they would route them to a, a group of data librarians, librarians who felt more comfortable and were more well-versed with data and with PER to, to handle. And so essentially, in uh, the question point software that we use for reference, this is all done via online workflow. Um, the question is assigned to a data librarian. There's a mailing list. We get a notification. And then there are like about, I don't know, seven or eight of us that are a member of this group. Whoever gets to it first claims it and assigns the ticket to themselves. And then they work with the subject specialist librarian um, from whatever department the faculty member is from. So if it's civil engineering faculty, then the civil engineering librarian would work together with the data librarian and triage the, 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 the question of the problem. And this has happened in practice in email and telephone and person and all of these ways that librarians normally do reference. Uh, when the issues are closed, we tag them as reference, as, as uh, data questions for reporting. We haven't been doing this long enough to have done an assessment, but that's uh, part, of the, uh, part of our future plan. And uh, we sent bookmarks out to all of our physical uh, reference desks because librarians love bookmarks. So where are we at now um, in terms of adoption of PER? Uh, we have 62 projects that have been created. Um, Understanding a lot of people are just testing the water. There are real projects. There are many test projects, but 167 registered users. This is the thing I think that is um, really exhilarating and also terrifying is that uh, 312 proposals um, have come from Purdue citing PER as a component of its data management plan. 180 of those are pending. 11 of them have been uh, awarded. So. Purdue cares about the National Science Foundation. They're our number one uh, funder of research on campus. And so this constitutes uh, just over a third of all, uh, one third of all of the NSF proposals that have come from, from PER, come from Purdue, uh, include PER. Others include the USDA, EPA, NASA, NEH, US Forest Service, et cetera. So what happens when a grant is awarded? Our sponsored program services uh, looks for mentions of PER in the data management plan. They flag them. Uh, when an award is made, uh, we get an email notification. We have a data librarian, a number of our uh, research data services group. We'll tag team with the subject specialist librarian and go make contact with the faculty member, the researcher, and uh, again, do that same kind of triage that I was describing with the data reference. Um, we uh, track the follow-up interactions on a wiki. Um, this is really good feedback for us in the PER design group to get this kind of instant feedback from our, from our, our researchers. What are your expectations? Um, you know, what, what, um, what is your experience uh, with PER? So very, very quickly, I'd just like to talk about some opportunities that PER is creating for our librarians to interact with uh, our researchers and use the, the, the workflow here. So just like uh, David and Barbara talked about, our librarians are consulting in data management plans in their respective subject areas. When um, a, a researcher creates a project in PER, the librarian is notified in email. They're, they're not obligated to do anything, it's just an opportunity to know that the project has been created. Uh, you follow up with that in whatever way is appropriate based on you know, the, the practice in your discipline, your relationship with the department, et cetera. This is based on the department affiliation of the Purdue project owner. Um, that may lead to the librarian collaborating um, or advising on the project. I already talked about how librarians uh, serve as kind of a gatekeeper function. And then again, at the end of the initial commitment, uh, the subject specialist librarian, and maybe a different person, but whoever is in that position, works with the digital archivist to select the data set for the library's collection or not. So two months ago, we were funded. We submitted a budget plan, development plan for four years. We were funded for a year and a half. Uh, these are some of the positions that are being created, some of the resources that are being marshaled. So two digital library software developers, a digital data repository specialist, 
we're hiring these positions now. If you're interested, come talk to me. 20% um, of the metadata specialist, a digital archivist, a graduate student, and uh, engage in the Center for Research Libraries and undergoing a trusted digital repository certification. Uh, on the IT side, the slide's a little bit lunged up, but essentially it's a technical project manager, web developer, software developer, security expert, middle data, middleware developer, and also um, a cushion for um, hardware uh, storage and supplies and expenses. So um, another thing that's happened recently is that PER has been identified as a um, university research core. So that leads to the kind of recurring support for the service. So we still have a lot of work to do, outreach. Many of the steps that I outlined are actually manual steps right now. Um, we need uh, better and more metadata and management. Um, curation microservices integration, and that's, I mentioned the ISO 16363 certification. The tool publication uh, process will be implemented this summer. I talked about publishing uh, data sets the other kind of resource in PER is a software tool, and so we'll be doing that this summer. And then in January of 2013, we'll be evaluating and assessing, basically looking at our four-year plan and saying, this is what we thought we would need. A year and a half into it, how you know how close were we? You know, uh, do we overestimate? Do we underestimate? What kind of adoption do we have? And so I just want to acknowledge um, the people who have helped make this possible, and again, just. Um, Mention again the collaborative nature of this IT libraries and research office. Thank you.